Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule on a Tuesday. I know that we have people registered and attending this webinar from Canada, all over Canada, uh, in the UK, a couple of US attendees here. So we're really excited to have everybody here logged in um, and ready to learn about how to deliver your own growth, uh, specifically how to strategically uh, deliver your own growth with integrated deliverably and deliverability to accelerate your GMV. We're going to get right started here. Uh, if there are any issues with visibility or connectivity, um, please use the chat agent as part of Zoom webinars to let me know. My name is Jessica Thiel. I'm the director of marketing for VL Omni, um, and we'll definitely address any technical issues that way. Uh, as a housekeeping note, we will be providing all registered attendees um, both the deck that we present here today and a recording of the presentation at the end of the day. We really want to make this the most useful uh, tool for you strategically growing that GMV at the end of the day with uh, strategic deliverability and integration. So let's get started here today. Joining us as our co-presenters, we have David Lynch, uh, the director, growth director at Line 10. Uh, David, are you here? Can you uh, maybe say hello to our audience? Hey, how are you doing? Yeah, I can hear you very clearly. Fantastic. And everybody can see the, the presentation too, I hope. <laughs> I can see it very clearly and it looks as good as, uh, as it was yesterday. So. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, and then from our own team here at VL Omni, we have Rob and H. Smith, our CEO and co-founder, who's going to be taking on our side of the conversation for this presentation. Robin, you would like to introduce yourself? Yes. Good morning, everybody. And uh, David, good to chat again. And um, apparently we have someone uh, logged in from Australia also. So, uh, oh, wow. Yeah. So I <laughs> think our reach today is absolutely global. Evening viewing. I guess Evening viewing, here. yeah. <laughs> All right, so moving forward here. If you would like to join the conversation, we are going to be actively tweeting during this webinar. So if you can manage two screens at once and log into Twitter or Facebook, uh, you can of course follow uh, both VL Omni and Line 10 on Twitter to participate in the conversation there. But after the presentation, if you're not able to juggle multiple apps at once, please check out our hashtag, deliver your own growth. Um, and then involve yourself in the conversation by using that hashtag, whether you tag our accounts or not, we'll be monitoring that hashtag. Really looking forward to seeing what kind of broader conversation we get out of this presentation today. So a little bit of an introduction about who is behind the screen today um, presenting uh, this great webinar. A uh, little bit about VL Omni. We are a cloud-based EU GDPR compliant platform for agile and scalable iPaaS data integration, or if you're not as technical, data automation. We consult to create strategic data and integrations that maintain a central point of data truth, and we welcome you to visit our website and Line 10's website if you have any more questions or are curious to discover a little bit more about either of us. A little bit about Line 10. Since 2013, Line 10 has focused on making delivery, uh, delivery, <laughs> delivery simple by simple through the power of integration and aggregation. Powered by a rules engine, Line 10's deliverability management platform plugs and plays deliverably API technology with the aim to satisfy both supply and demand. And I'm tripping over my words this morning. It's early morning in Toronto here still, so forgive me on that one. What we are going to be covering today, uh, we'll start off by giving a little bit of context to the conversation. First and foremost, the state of e-commerce deliverability today. Uh, bridging from that, a world apart, regional deliverability differences, since not all regions operate the same, specifically between Canada and the UK, there's some pretty significant geography differences that we'll get into. Uh, then we'll bridge into deliverability all-stars, how the best are using delivery as a strategy, really breaking down some case studies and how they're succeeding. Uh, and then we'll get into VL Omni and Line 10, how you can strategically uh, grow your GMB with delivery integration. Um, finally, we'll round out with the importance of customer experience, and then we'll open up to the audience for a Q&A. So getting right into it, I'll introduce this final slide and then I'll pass it on to uh, Robin and David. We'll start with the state of e-commerce delivery. David? Yeah, absolutely. So 
just as we jump in here, I mean, obviously, everybody that's joined today, first of all, thank you for joining. It's actually really exciting to kind of get to dive in and talk a little bit more about the relationship that we have with Omni and what we've been doing uh, over the course of the last year. Um, what we kind of wanted to touch on here was the state of play that we know uh, within the client facing, i.e. what you guys are probably most used to today. And that's, that's why we have Amazon there driving the standard for delivery. And we just wanted to talk about, you know, what we're competing with and what we're trying to do by working with VL Omni. So you see, you know, customer expectations are drive are the driving force for accelerated changes in e-commerce and delivery was used to the Amazon delivery model, expect a near perfect experience from click to delivery. And then just that Amazon's domination is forcing merchants to compete with more delivery options, unique experience and faster than ever delivery times. Now, the really interesting piece here is that Amazon are indeed setting a standard not the highest standard, but a, a, a baseline, a standard that we're finding retailers out there are looking for in terms of to compare against or compete against, which is totally reasonable. Um, but what we're also realizing is that retailers are looking for a solution that Amazon themselves are not offering, which is often 15 minute delivery min windows or an on demand delivery window that even Amazon themselves aren't committing. And the reason that Amazon aren't doing that is because they realize that hourly slots, hourly windows, um, and a more relaxed service level agreement or lesser service level agreement uh, dressed up to be fast and effective is, is, is a more successful endeavor. And the way that you can get there as a retailer is by aligning yourself in strategic partnerships. So that's why we wanted to look at that today is the reason why VL Omni and Line 10 are working together is because We've built this partnership to ensure that when we work with a retailer, if it's VL Omni focusing and doing an incredibly good job on the integration side from an EPOS standpoint of view, when it's Line 10 involved, it's that we are a strategic logistics partner. We're not someone that sits there to say, hey, sure, we will take your delivery, your, your pickup that you've given us in a delivery point. Um, and, and get it where you want to go. No, what it is, is we're going to sit down with you and understand what are the challenges that you have today? What's the product you're delivering today? And who are you trying to reach and why? And why are you trying to commit yourself to that delivery window versus that delivery window? So the, the big piece I want to say here is that, you know, the, the time to compete is now, but how you decide to compete is really, really important. And aligning yourself with strategic strong partners like Viet Omni and, and Line 10 that are looking for ways to offer something different to Amazon to support the likes of Shopify customers and more is what's really important. Uh, sorry, I, I had one of our CEOs walk in, uh, one of our CXOs walk in the door there and got a little bit disturbed and had to try and buffer to him to say, please don't talk <laughs> whilst trying to explain the point. Sorry, continue. No, no worries, Dave. I, I'm going to jump in and ask you a question here because Shopify at uh, the recent Unite conference in Toronto announced the establishment and a billion dollar investment in their delivery network. So clearly this is, this is something now that's on everybody's uh, screen and everybody's looking at that competitive edge because as you say, Amazon has set that standard. Absolutely. And, but I, I do look at that Shopify announcement. I say it's a billion dollar investment. And I'm wondering how much of that is going to end up being a super sunk and lost cost versus something that really turns to fruition. Because at the end of the day, what Amazon have done intelligently is no matter what, you know, I think four years ago, they announced that we'd be using drones everywhere. Everything would be automated. But yeah. it's still an incredibly manual process. And it's yeah. a manual process because they're trying their best to own every part of the journey as much as possible. Whilst what we're trying to endeavor or push is to do a holistic review of the products you offer and the expectations of those customers that require those products and see what type of delivery windows you need to fit to. So when you look at Shopify announcing such a, such a proposition, there will have to be partners even within that Shopify proposition. Like, oh, I would agree. And I think time we'll wait, will Yeah, we'll wait and see. But, but, but what I believe is that that billion dollar investment, that's not going to be wholly within Shopify and, internal fleets, that's going to be within the partnerships that Shopify start to expand on and, and release as time goes by. That yeah. could be us, that could be yourselves and more, but I don't, I don't see that as being something that Shopify will indeed, and excuse the pun, fulfill themselves. <laughs> so let's move on because I think one of the things that came out of Shop Talk was some interesting stats that, um, you know, I think you were interested in sharing. 
Yeah. So I suppose this is a really interesting one. You know, trends show a 17% improvement in time for online orders fulfillment and delivery in 2018. Now, you know, via Omni 910, we're, we're both working in this space here where um, ultimately finding a way to connect the e-commerce journey uh, more effectively to the end customer is, is really what's going to be the key differentiator. So obviously as a logistics platform, we're very much a part of that puzzle. Um, and when you look at that 17% improvement, that doesn't just sit in terms of the integrations offered, the plugins, which you guys obviously are incredibly comfortable with and, and work around obviously being a partner to Shopify, but that has to do as well with how either quickly you can deliver or how regularly you uphold a service level agreement. That means, you know, if it's a 90 minute window or a same day or a slot time window, how well are you delivering that service? And, and the way you're gonna deliver that service most effectively is by ensuring you can manage the customer's expectations from the beginning. Like those retailers that wanna offer services like Amazon and want to see that 17% improvement in their own domain, they need to understand very clearly what is the least that they have to offer that customer and then improve from there, create a story, a narrative, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that bridges well into our next slide here, David, if you wanna continue. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, 26% of merchants who had faster shipping experience, faster overall growth. Now, before people that are listening in today get scared, this isn't moving from a seven day service to an on demand in 45 minute service. Uh, this varies on a per market basis. That's the exciting thing. So if you're dialing in from Australia, we know, you know, you've the likes of Shepherd, you've uh, the likes of uh, Tamando, obviously doing a lot of work in more the next day space out there, but there's, there is a customer expectation that differs on a per market basis. Now, obviously retailers want to offer a holistic and, and ultimately same experience everywhere. But really, if you're playing the game right, what you're doing is you, you should be looking at what the definition of faster is on a per market basis. And that faster might be narrowing it from seven days down to five to three, rather than cutting seven days to on demand. Like we know, and, and we've talked about this a lot with you guys, when we launched uh, Willow Park Wine and Spirits in, in Calgary, uh, we originally launched with an on-demand service. That was to be delivered within the hour. Did it work? Absolutely. We had a pickup time, our average pickup time with our fleet there, which is a, a thousand man fleet that's in the form of a private car hire service, was two minutes. Two minutes between a booking and pickup, which meant we actually had to put in a, a, a buffer time to give the store time to pack, pick and pack their, their goods. But what we actually realized was the service that should have been launched first was a slot service. Uh, a slot service that allowed us to create uh, a number of drops and thereby drop the overarching cost on a per drop uh, delivery. Uh, but instead we went with an on demand because the customer said, or the retailer rather got excited at the thought of it, but it didn't actually bear the fruits that, that we thought it would bear. So, my learning there is decide what the definition of faster shipping is carefully, uh, if that makes sense. No, it's a very important observation, especially in light of the fact that the average delivery time is going down. And, and you know, it's something that I don't think people take into consideration. And I think the example you gave is actually a really good one of the retailer getting excited by delivering products faster, but not totally understanding what the consumer actually wants. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Try and imagine a consumer that has an on-demand option and it's delivered in 30 minutes and you know they accidentally jump out for a phone call and they miss that window. We've yeah. all had that experience with marketplaces, food marketplace in particular. And it's interesting that we jump onto this slide because you know obviously I'm not telling people to move into a slower by definition form of delivery, but same day delivery alone can provide a service that suits your customers. You know, we're launching with the Calgary Co-op um, in two weeks time and, and we're offering a slot service um, and what we'll end up offering down the line is probably a weighted slot service. So we'll uh, charge more for certain hours of the day, on demand hours if you will, or hours where we have peaks in food delivery, peaks in, in hot food delivery rather, so you, you can imagine what those hours are, um, which will then actually push these customers for a higher cost, which is something by the way as a retailer if you're listening, you can take as a, as a further margin to your boat uh, for a higher cost to be pushed into the troughs of the day. Um, so that's all this kind of slide points on. Would it be fair, and I open this up to both uh, Robin and David, 
Um, is faster always better or is it better to fit the uh, needs and your strategic uh, goals to what your customers are actually looking for? I think, I think it's, I think it's the latter. If, uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like comparing delivering uh, groceries uh, to kind of someone who has scheduled reoccurring orders every week, same food, you know, they're busy lifestyle leader versus someone who uh, is impulsive, someone who forgets to do their shopping, needs that last minute support and is willing to pay through the roof for it. Um, and so it's defining that customer base, which is all about your strategy, not tactical. Uh, it's all strategic. And then deciding what delivery propositions you actually should be offering. So, you know, a really interesting piece about that co-op Calgary relationship that we're, that we're launching is they have stores that are in conurbations of Calgary that have older demographics. And we know that the slot delivery is going to be perfect. We also know that pushing those customers into troughs of the day, i.e. quieter days, is perfect because in many instances you might have, uh, you know, uh, retired customers, customers that have more free time. Uh, obviously, Calgary is a very field sales, field oriented market. So that means that they don't, they're not stuck to their desks, stuck in offices. They can actually hit windows of delivery at, at times that are pretty flexible. But then at the same time, downtown, you have another site that's within the financial hub of Calgary. Now, those customers we know are actually between the ages of 20 and 35. So you know what's going to come with that. It's going to come with whatever is the next shiny new thing. And, and a part of that is being able to deliver to me when I want, if that's in the next 45 minutes or the next hour. So in one customer alone, you, and based on the sites that you have, you've got to strategically think about what service offerings you're going to give uh, from the different sites across the city to suit the demographics within uh, those different sectors of the city. No, it's an interesting point you make, and it, it actually segues really nicely, David, into the whole, um, the whole trend of personalization and more and more you're seeing uh, retailers looking for any one of those personalization angles. Um, and, and, and I think shipment and delivery is just simply another angle where uh, the retailer can personalize the experience. Absolutely. Great. Okay. Moving on here. Yeah, this is an interesting one. And this is what we kind of talked about when we were preparing this, uh, this deck here, you know, 92% of shipping was free for customers. Now that doesn't mean shipping was free across the board. It was how you decided to charge your customers. But if you look, when you're looking at the previous slide, you know that customers are willing to pay more for a different type of service offering. And obviously that depends on conurbations, which we just discussed, depends on the city. It depends on so many factors. Um, but this is an interesting one because what we should be asking ourselves here is, you know, how was it free? Like this statistic here sits a lot with, with, for example, Amazon. Amazon, technically, if you're a prime user, every delivery you have is free, but is that service actually free? Probably not. Well, and who's, who's ultimately paying for it? Is it bundled into the cost of the product? Is it, is it uh, you know, is it, is it, uh, it, exactly. It's ultimately what this is saying, and it's really important for retailers to, to know and to think about is customers and customers are, believe it or not, are, are actually fading into a new, are moving into a new phase where they know there is a cost, a premium cost associated with a certain service of delivery, right? We know that five to seven day delivery is something that is often absorbed by the retailer. Uh, we know that three to five day delivery starts to add incremental costs there. And then as we move into two day, one day delivery, and you're looking at providers like DHL and UPS, now we're starting to ramp up what is front facing costs, client facing costs. And then before that, and then, and then finally we move into the on demand space and we start to say, you know, or the same day space, what does that look like? But if we're looking at, at currently what is defined as free delivery, free delivery is often uh, paid for in, in other ways. And with Amazon, it's a subscription fee. Combined, obviously, there are other AWS services that they offer to, to supplement that cost. So it's deciding as a retailer, do you want to offer your customer free delivery? Do your customers need free delivery? Or are they happy to pay for delivery? 
And sorry, Robin, for kind of dragging on, but good case studies, you know, Farfetch, one of our global customers, their average basket size is 900 pounds. 900 pounds for an average basket size. You're talking a pair of shoes will cost you $5,000, right? Yeah. Now the question you'd ask yourself is, will that customer get to the end of a journey and see a $20 fee for a same day delivery and say, oh, I'm not paying for that? Probably not. Those customers are probably gonna pay for it because they don't connect or associate that high price to what they're paying for the basket. At the same time, Farfetch, which is you know a general strategy for them, they're willing to absorb that cost. They're willing to go so far as, which is a service we offer today, <laughs> to uh, deliver out clothes to a customer for upwards of $300 a delivery. Why? Because they will deliver to you for you to try clothes on, and then that driver will wait for two, three, four hours outside your door to return then those clothes. And you mightn't have bought any of the clothes, but if you buy one, then the cost of delivery doesn't mean anything. So just to the retailers listening, it's important that you define whether one, your customers need free shipping or not, and in what bands, i.e. next day, three to five day, five to seven day, you know, what bands they, they should be having free delivery versus not. I don't know, Robin, if you want to add anything to that. You know, and to me, this just highlights what, what the customer experience is and what the DNA of the brand is. You know, like it, this is no different than what people visualize on the front end of their website. It said, yeah, if, if the driver is going to sit there for three hours while you try on clothes and you return what you don't want, I mean, that's got to be part of your, your, your brand experience. And uh, so I, I think in the past, people strategically have looked at shipping as just, well, I just got to get the good out. And it's got to arrive at the customer in a timely manner and it can't be damaged. I think today it's, it's shifted. And, and, it, and as you say, it's much more about what is the customer experience. Absolutely. And I think that bridges well into our next slide here. Uh, in different ways to, to fulfill that delivery process. So I'll pass this back over to you, David. Yeah, sure. So I guess the aim today to those listening was to give you some examples in terms of in terms of how a proposition like line 10, and I guess combined with BL Omni can support um, reaching your customers in a more effective way. Click and carry online sales grew 22% to 27% in 2018. So that's a really interesting statistic because it, it still suggests a customer wants to go to store or is happy to go to store and happy not to pay what is a fee to get to home. It also adds more depth in terms of a customer's lifestyle. For example, is it easier for a customer to go to the store rather than have to be home by a certain time? And so when we look at all these different brands here, uh, it's trying to decipher across the board what would suit their proposition. You know, now some of the brands here, we at Line 10 are actually speaking to, unfortunately on this call, I can't mention as, as, as we're not at the signing template yet, but one of them here that I'm gonna mention, and you are as retailers more than welcome to go off and and create the narrative you see fit in terms of who that is. They have 50 different delivery companies on their books. They do over a million and a half deliveries a year. And of those 50 different delivery companies, two are integrated, i.e. two have an integrated audit trail into that e-commerce engine that they use. So that means 48 are manually assigned either via an email a text message, a phone call, uh, with no audit trail, i.e. no S service level agreement whatsoever. You don't know when it's gonna arrive, it's gonna arrive. Everyone from uh, an on-demand local delivery company to literally John and a tractor and trailer in Ontario. All right, I've narrowed it down a tiny bit, giving you a little bit, giving you a little bit more definition there. But for that type of retailer, not in terms of trying to scale or, or rather transfer over uh, and migrate over to what the likes of Amazon are offering and Shopify are offering, that's very, very hard to control, especially when that's not what you do. Like that's not what you're selling. You're not selling logistics. You don't have a team or at least a team large enough. And certainly you don't have enough case studies internally to be able to compare it to and understand what the best next step is for you. That's, that's quite the challenge. Whilst when you look at line 10, obviously as an aggregation platform, we have an overarching view of 
all these different customers that we work with and we're even able to take ideas you can say steal ideas but from one uh, customer that we have and one logistics solution that we have with that customer and then push it into another customer so that really if you're looking at that said customer that has 50 different delivery companies you know it we're able to understand okay well that customer probably needs to first of all hone down the companies that are doing a good job versus the bad job the companies that have technical capability versus don't have technical capability the companies that should have technical capability because they are operationally sound and move from there um, but I mean, look, you look at these examples here, every single proposition, delivery proposition, whether you believe as a retailer listening today, think that they're all the same, they're not. They require different dimensions, different, different SKU integrations in terms of being able to match a SKU to a dimension size, which is then matched to a vehicle size. size. They require the ability to hold stock once an order is in place for a delivery provision to collect versus say, for example, which is of course, if you look at Farfetch, their most important customer can often be a click and collect customer versus a delivery customer. Um, so how do you define when there's still something on the rack that's been purchased online? How do you give that customer in store the right service to ensure they don't leave and return again? Um, well, it also speaks, David, to the need for accurate inventory. And as you highlighted with your example of only two have an integrated audit trail, Good, good, solid integration with your backend systems so that you've got complete visibility. Yeah, totally. And you know, working with the Co-op UK, this is a really interesting one. And, and I think we've talked about this in depth before. We use the tracking, GPS updates, status updates, proof of delivery, not only for a customer experience, but it is very much an audit trail. It yes. can be audited. And it, it can protect the end customer. Because at the end of the day, you always want to know where the parcel is, why it's gotten there, why it hasn't gotten there. You want to know where the drivers are and why they've gotten there and why they haven't gotten there. And does there need to be a replacement driver? Does there not need? You know, there's a whole host of questions that revolve around actually an, an incredible advantage to having tracking of a live job. Um, so for all these customers that we're looking at here, they all have very different propositions, although they might not believe it just yet. I mean, Apple for sure. I mean, Apple is an example are, 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 are you know, a, a really best in class example of a company that understands logistics isn't our thing. We're going to outsource it. We're not going to spend time trying to fix that. Instead, we're going to focus on understanding how we can grow our margin uh, atop what is our, our proposition, be it the iPhone, be it the Mac, you name it, uh, and leave the logistics piece and the cost per unit to our partners. Well, and the other thing that you raise uh, as a sideline here is freight auditability because freight auditing is a multi-million dollar business. And uh, I'm constantly amazed at how much discrepancy there is in billing from the carriers to the retailers and how much, how many mistakes get made there. So, I mean, that's a side, no, that's a completely separate conversation, but mm -hmm. it's, but it highlights the need for this strategy. Um, you know, want, we're, we're talking about logistics right now, but like, you know, where, wow, I sounded almost Canadian there. You know, <laughs> uh, excuse me, for those that are in Australia, you've put up with enough Irish accent, so I'm sure you're probably happy to hear something a bit more refreshing than, than, than my normal trend. But, you know, you, you have not only a logistics proposition to solve, but an integration proposition or rather problem. Like, how will you go about integrating into all these different delivery companies into the EPOS and connecting EPOS to your delivery management platform so it knows what's available and where? Um, there's, there's a bigger picture there, which goes back to my original point of these types of companies needing a strategic partner rather than just a delivery company to pick something up from point A to point B. Well, and that actually jumps right into the... Uh... The you know, not particularly this particular slide, but the one after where we talk about the the, the strategy around uh, things. So, mm -hmm. Jessica. Let's quickly talk to this one, David, and then we'll move into the, the rest of the yeah, discussion. Yeah, I'll just spend time on this one. I think this is a really interesting one. You know, you've highlighted some incredible, uh, incredible brands that are out there today doing incredible work, like DoorDash are uh, an amazing, uh, an, an amazing company, you know, uh, 
I think they have scaled somewhat 70-80% in, in, in the last 16 months um, and incredibly collaborative. That's all I'm going to say. I don't want to hint any more out there to the ether, but they are a really interesting company, but so are the others here. Um, and, and the reason why uh, 10 billion is the word there is, is because they're supporting customers who needed a service rather than just wanted a service. So I'm not going to spend any time on this because I feel like I've harked on enough, but it just yeah. shows you the importance of getting a solution right. Yep, uh, that bridges really right well into this one. Yeah, no, which, you know, I, I think if I were to summarize that uh, this, this quote actually summarizes things beautifully. If you're not thinking strategically about fulfillment, you're not thinking strategically about e-commerce. And I would even add retail into that. Um, as you've highlighted, David, there's, there's, there's different ways to deliver. And I think we've, we've, we've seen Amazon set the standard. You've seen delivery times drop from about 4.3 days um, in 2017 to 2018, 2.1 days. So velocity is increasing. And if retailers can use that as a strategic advantage, not only from the, from the personalization perspective, um, but it's also an interesting way to grow their GMV. And I think this is where we started. And, um, but there's some pitfalls. And I think we've, we've, we've touched upon in, in your conversation, Dave, some of these pitfalls. You talk about 50, 50 carriers, two of which are integrated, and the challenges of integrating all of those carriers to your backend systems. Um, I, would, I would wonder how 50 carriers operate effectively in a model where you're not doing any freight rating, like who's managing the contracts, who's managing the, the auditing, and who's, at, who's managing the Absolutely right. I mean, we haven't even touched negotiations. That. The, the service level agreements, managing that, and, and quickly, I'll just jump on a quick case study there. I feel like you were plugging me, so I appreciate that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, one of our partners in the UK is Krispy Kreme. Uh, we're doing about 1,000 deliveries a week uh, for Krispy Kreme right now out of very small number of stores, which will scale to about 6,000 deliveries a week uh, in the coming eight to 10 weeks, right? Now, originally, Krispy Kreme... Uh, Amazing guys, amazing team. But they looked at uh, having the service level discussions primarily with the delivery providers first, agreeing them, and then saying, okay, line 10, we've got this nailed down, we're ready to roll. Um, over to you from a technical standpoint, operational QA, et cetera, to get this live and, and ready to go. And what we found, one was the service levels that they had agreed, it was two delivery provisions. Uh, didn't one cover all the hours of the day, only covered up to 10 p.m., not 2 a.m. Uh, so you can imagine committing, uh, volume, committing a volume of work to these two partners on paper and then trying to go out and say to other delivery companies, hey, I was wondering if you'd be interested in doing a couple of jobs between the hours of 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. It's not an amazing sell to be no. donuts to, you know, the, the wonderful human beings of the 2 a.m. hour, right? Uh, <laughs> including, including myself. Um, the, the second problem was days of the week were not agreed. So because days of the week were not agreed, these two delivery provisions added further costs on the weekend, 50% actually on bank holidays and weekends. So now the costs have changed dramatically. So P&L from an FD standpoint, financial director standpoint, doesn't look great. Um, and now what was three rules in order to add every single provision to change those days of the week, we ended up adding five different delivery companies uh, who covered all hours of this solution with four different commercial schemes from dedicated vehicle provisioning to per drop provisioning to quasi both, you name it. Um, and then ensuring that we had the right adapters in place to capture the right status updates. Some needed geofencing. Uh, in order to have status updates added, uh, and, uh, which was a lot of fun. Uh, st some needed further testing due to the lack of GPS updates, because we know that sometimes delivery companies don't want to push GPS updates because they're, you know, depending on their dispatch system, they're charged on tasks and they're charged on per ping. So I completely understand that. But we ended up having 30 rules 
within our algorithm, 30 rules within the rules engine, managing that proposition, which is stressful. <laughs> but it's the big not, learning one, if we were at the table, at the meeting, we would have been able to negotiate the right service level agreements with those partners. And then we would have been able to say, not only that, we would have been able to go back to that customer and say, hey, you know, maybe it's best we launch with this to ensure that these delivery partners are comfortable. And then we scale into the other hours as required. Yeah, so, you know, this is interesting because really what you're saying is step back, think strategically, detangle yourself or untangle yourself from legacy, legacy processes that, that are Band-Aid on top of Band-Aid. Um, and and look at look at how you integrate and how you rationalize across the organization and i don't think a lot of people do that i think it's really just a matter of of um of of well i got to get the product out so, uh, and i don't blame them try and imagine being a you know a, a contractor or a project manager you're brought in you have gates you need to hit you know step one two three four and suddenly these intricacies come into play and you don't want to think about it. And that's the really important thing. Don't, don't think about it. Yeah. We're here. Well, and I think, uh, I think that, I think that this is all part of the strategy. It comes back to thinking strategically. So let's, let's, let's move on to uh, regional differences. Cause I think regional differences to me are really, really interesting. You're in the UK. I'm in Canada. Um, we have very different geographies. We've got, very different approaches to retail. One of the things that that's, that that strikes me whenever I travel is um, the the compactness of retail in different parts of the world, and how you make delivery work in all of these 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 uh, places. But what has really struck me is that Europe is, in many ways, for progressive delivery is far, far ahead of North America. And I think some of that is geography. We, we in Canada have an enormous geography. Actually, it takes, takes the same amount of time for me to fly from Toronto to London as it does from Toronto to Vancouver, um, which speaks to the geography. We have northern regions that are so far out that um, last mile is impossible. So what we do see, though, is that you've got you've got these regional changes. In North America, we've been much slower on the click and collect, uh, buy online, pick up in store, and we've got some stats here to to highlight some of this. And I think this for North American retailers, less so for those of you in the UK, and I would suspect that Australia is probably similar to North America given the geographies. But you've got a really interesting business opportunity here in terms of being able to grow your GMV. So in the UK, most retailers, and actually this stat when we dug it out surprised me, 64% offer a click and collect option. So click and collect is uh, I buy online and I pick up in store. Um, the differences to me are astounding. I can't think of very many Canadian retailers and similarly for North America, for US-based um, retailers, I can't think of many that allow me to buy online and pick up in store effectively. Like I've got to go and drive to the store, which now has a segue into shipping. Um, well, I think a quick point to jump in there is, you know, for any retailers that are listening is, yes, North America is behind for sure. But if we look at, let's say Amazon as a blueprint project, right? Like you launch an Amazon HQ to you launch a warehouse, let's say in Southern Alberta, and you test a next day proposition and then a same day proposition. That model becomes very, uh, like very easy to replicate for Amazon. So yes. all right now you look at these statistics, you know, maybe as retailers out there might be looking at their P&L and thinking, is this the priority for me in the next six months, next 12 months? Well, against my competitors, probably not. And Amazon haven't yet come close to introducing that service. Actually, you know, it's not waiting for customers to catch up and want the service. It's, it's just when they want to launch it, they'll launch it. And these statistics will suddenly change dramatically. Oh, Except that percentage, that 31% of click and collect, and let's say if we turn that into transactions, 
31% being the, transact the, the amount of transactions going through current retailers available, like enterprise retailers, that will move very swiftly on Amazon because customers don't have uh, patience threshold to wait for retailers to catch up. No, so you're they almost more looking at a calm before a storm rather than a gradual like increase. Yes, Seoul, Korea, London, United Kingdom, they're the two most viscerally, uh, you know, uh, I guess, up to date from a click and collect and on-demand delivery standpoint, but that doesn't mean the world is way, like very far behind. And, and Amazon is testament to that. And it's very important that retailers know that like, if you're waiting for something to happen from someone else, you're approaching it the wrong way. You probably need to just be thinking about your customers and what they want and what they need and ensuring that they don't go somewhere else for that service, probably obviously more importantly, move to Amazon. Because if you lose them, the additional services around that piece will consume them. And, and it'll be very hard to pull them back into your sphere. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna you know, go down to the bottom right-hand corner because to me, there's a dichotomy here, which is very interesting. And that is that there's a very high buy online return in store option. So why, why a retailer wouldn't think strategically along the lines of what you're saying to offer the click and collect, if you're going to return the item in store, why wouldn't you allow the, the consumer to pick that product up in store also? Because you, if, if you're already returning on, uh, in store and you're encouraging them to do more shopping, um, it's exactly the same thing. The other thing that I find really interesting about these stats is basic inventory visibility um, speaks to back-end systems and the lack of proper integration and the batch nature of integration so that somebody, somebody goes online and I, I can't think of the number of sites I've gone online where I've looked looked up uh, a uh, product only to find out that I can't tell whether it's actually in the store. Um, the running room in Canada, for example, is terrible. You, you try and find the in-store inventory and you've got to navigate five, five um, points of screen and it becomes, it becomes impossible. And you don't even know if it's accurate. Um, in one case, I phoned a store looking for a pair of shoes and oh, they said, oh, no, our website's not up to date. Uh, we don't have that. I think, I think like a really great example of that, and I can't name the company, I'm sure, because I love their business, but there's a bookstore <laughs> yeah. so, you know, in Canada, one of the largest. They also do like home and yeah. you know, furnishings and stuff like that. So any Canadian listening will know who they are. They've got a cool name. Um, they do not count stock today. And only 18 months ago, did they implement a new warehouse outside of Calgary. So yes. one thing that you'd have an EPOS that would naturally have endpoints, endpoints for those necessarily not technically literate, like plugs that you can, you can plug into to pull data, i.e. is it there, is it not there, when is it ready, how long does it take to get ready? They don't have that available now. They built that without the, the ability to offer that service. Now that brand are, in my eyes, I think they're, they're incredible. They're still very connected to the customer today. They have a great online journey, but the fact that you purchase something online and you go in a store to click and collect and pick it up and they tell you they don't have it is really incredible. And like can only lead to a customer choosing not to return again. Because the beauty of Amazon is Amazon don't offer a click and collect service. So unless you're in somewhere like you know, Seattle for their, their home store, but they don't offer a click and collect service, which means they'll never have that problem of someone no. walking in, dry, getting in their car, snowy, wintry, horribly humid, wintry day in Ontario. Sorry, I'm a fan of Calgary. It's drier weather, better, better skiing. But um, getting in their car and driving to this store to find out that like, actually we don't have that and we'll have it in three weeks. Yeah, which is insane, which is insane. And I guess they left you kind of blue, so <laughs> it was... Uh, mm -hmm. um, so just yeah. in the interest of time, uh, moving forward, I know that, David, you had mentioned some of these great case studies of uh, companies that are already using, you know, the, the competitive edges that are present definitely in Canada versus the uh, UK on our previous slide there to their advantage. But maybe we can quickly summarize well, I can, can run through 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 reach out time. or visit Line 10's website to dig into these case studies more. So I'll pass that over to you. 
Yeah, sure. So Firefetch, we spoke about it. I think what's really interesting here is we're using a rules engine to push work to 20 different provisions globally, um, not only in a same day space, but also entering a next day space. Um, now, before that, Firefetch, no joke, had customer support guys who used to use Google Translate to enter uh, information about a job to have a company like Lala Move in Asia deliver that job because Lala Move didn't have the support at the time uh, fluent in English. Could you imagine trying to get updates on a job? Where is it? When is it arriving? You know, a $10,000 order. Uh, it can be quite a nightmare, quite a stress. And their service level was really not in a good place. Now, as we onboard more and more of these same day partners, which is great for us because we're tactically entering these markets that are soon to become strategic markets for us. Um, we're seeing obviously an automation in terms of comms. We're seeing feedback, callbacks, GPS tracking, status updates. So life is a lot easier for Firefetch. If you want to skip to the next one. Five Guys, I mean, this is a great example. Um, with Five Guys, we work with them for NoQ uh, online ordering, which is our online ordering platform. That is also plugged into our NoQ POS bridge, which is our uh, it's a point of sale, specifically in the restaurant space. So you have the likes of NCR, Comtrex, Andromeda, Brink, uh, Micros, all on one platform. So for a Five Guys to be able to speak to their stores in different countries, conurbations, it makes life a lot easier when they don't have to carry out all those integrations themselves. But what got really interesting was just, and we're, we're, we're still working through this now in a, in a pilot phase, is is looking at the current delivery provision performance that they have. So the likes of Deliveroo, the likes of DoorDash, and understanding whether they are getting the right service levels or not, and whether line 10 would be the one that would monitor that service level. Because at the end of the day, five guys are only gonna know so much in terms of what's a good service versus an okay service and a bad service. But when we're solely focused on that space, uh, we're in the right place to say, actually, we're not just making life good, better for Five Guys, we're making life better for DoorDash because we're now understanding where and what conurbations and what delivery timeframes suits DoorDash versus having to take the whole pie. If you want to move to the next one. Gail's Bakery, a wonderful partner of ours. What's really great about this is we're using nine, 10 different delivery companies, but we probably rotated in and out 25 different delivery companies. Everyone from the smart tech startups, the hotshot uh, you know, logistics companies that you've heard of, the stewards, the quick ups, right down to taxi companies where we've built uh, integrations into their dispatch systems. So we're able to push them the same uh, job information, job description, as we would uh, a same day uh, smart tech logistics provider. And we're able to cover their 22 sites, average OTE hitting at 90%. When I say OTE, I mean our on-time stat, our on-time statistics. So that's really been a, a very successful proposition for us. One tiny piece on here is when we took over this uh, new contract, we were able to actually improve their operational efficiency in store. How did we do that? Well, our delivery providers were arriving and we ended up billing them maybe 30, 40,000 pounds in waiting time. To which Gail's obviously responded, what, what happened here? And we were able to calculate an average waiting time at every new site we onboarded for the first week uh, of upwards of 25 minutes. Why? Because bakers weren't showing up. Uh, bakers weren't delivering food out on time and they didn't have that audit trail before. So every single site we took over, there was a week of pain where bakers suddenly went, oh, actually we're being monitored through the waiting time that's been charged back to line 10. And we were able to feed that back into their ops team to improve efficiencies, either churn the bad eggs and ensure that they had the best staff, the best service that they were giving to their customers, not only for in-store, but click and collect and delivery as well. The entire organization had a knock-on effect. Their SKUs, or rather variability of SKUs and availability of SKUs, surge, which meant they were able to support the customers that were in store as well. So that was that, that for me is a really good example of line 10, not only hitting the delivery piece, but ensuring we can actually fix things within their organization on a, on a daily basis. Sorry, if you want to go to the next, I think that's the three, right? Yeah, that's the end. Okay, so let's get into the meat of it. Let's tell our audience how they can uh, create some of this GMB um, for themselves. 
Well, and let's look specifically at e-commerce. And I think I'm going to, I'm going to jump ahead because of the time wise, we're, we're sort of running a little late here. Um, but I think that there's, there, you know, for those of you that run e-commerce front ends and maybe are digitally first, uh, digitally native, um, and those that are in uh, certain verticals in the bricks and mortar space, there's three areas that we've identified where high, high velocity delivery uh, using a combination of what Line 10 and VL brings to the table. Um, you, David, you spoke about Willow Park in Calgary. It's a liquor and spirits um, company. They sell online. Uh, what we did there was to set up a set up a, a just-in-time delivery and that model again didn't quite work out the way the company wanted but it was basically the concept was I'm having a party I'm running out of wine uh, how do I get my wine how do, how do I uh, keep my guests happy and uh, the option was to uh, deliver uh, you know within a specific time frame so anybody in the liquor and spirits uh, outside of Ontario uh, there should be no problem there um, I think if I just add very quickly on that one, look, uh, to retailers listening, it's, it's really simple. Guess Bakery is that example of in, in cleaning up operational efficiency, inefficiencies to build a more functional product that you're then pushing out and churning out more volume to grow your business. So we're not even touching the truck yet before we do that. But if you're looking at Willow Park Wine and Spirits, it was simple. There are X number of customers that they want to deliver to that they can't facilitate uh, they were able to ultimately create like a, a side, a new business that was through this vertical of delivery. And that's right. really important because it still has to be profitable. It can't be a large percentage, 30%, which you often see in marketplaces. It was a, a set fixed fee on a per distance basis that they could shrink, that they could expand yeah. to ensure that they were making the margin that, that, that affected or, or, or hit their key performance indicators internally. Sorry, Robin, continue. Yeah, no, no, and I think that's that's that is very valuable, and that actually leads into another whole area that we we had touched on. It's not on this slide, but uh, cannabis. Uh, cannabis is now legal in Canada, and in certain provinces, uh, you are allowed to deliver to the end user. Uh, there's obviously age validation and and proof that you're the right person, but I think anybody that that's in cannabis retailing particularly in Saskatchewan and places like that. Um, and this is opening up in Europe as well as the US. Um, it, is, it is a huge opportunity. One of the interesting ones that we came across um, was in the beauty space. Um, I go to the hair salon to get my hair cut, but I don't know how important things are to basically arrive on time, but hair extensions apparently are very time sensitive. Um, so hair extensions are, are something that uh, suppliers in the beauty industry want to get to the salon within a specific delivery time. Um, so anybody in that industry that's listening, cosmetics, uh, beauty, I think uh, hair, that's, that, that is another huge one. Fashion and luxury goods, we've already talked about Farfetched and what they're doing. Um, one of our customers, Zero Halliburton out in New York, have, have implemented a uh, a same day a delivery service for their Alu suitcases, which are very high end. So there's a number of opportunities here that those retailers in those verticals can seize on immediately. Um, and, and I think we're going to see this just in time of delivery um, or this notion of faster velocity increase across the board. So I'm going to jump forward, David, for sake of time here. I'm going to bypass the examples because um, they're well laid out. Um, and I'm going to talk about how we integrate um, uh, between Sh Shopify, for example, just to give people an example of an e-commerce, uh, you know, um, orientation. So, uh, Via Omni is the integration platform. It's a serverless-based iPaaS solution. Um, what we do is we take the order off of Shopify, we push it up to Line 10 where that order now goes into the dispatch system and it gets tagged. So the retailer doesn't have to now, doesn't have to manually enter that order into the Line 10 platform. Um, Line 10 does its magic based on the couriers and the relationships that are set up on the back end. Um, 
just drop it in quickly, and the client's requirements. Are you, are you looking for a cost-effective solution, lesser delivery, smaller, bigger delivery windows? Are you looking for uh, a more premium uh, white glove service uh, oriented solution that delivers yeah. in specific windows? That's yeah. really important to understand because both for you and both for Line 10, the Alumni and Line 10, what we're trying to do is ensure that you as a client own your own destiny here and you can ensure that you're offering services that suit the product and suit the client. Sorry. Correct. No, and I think that's very valuable because, you know, delivery on a bicycle uh, is totally different than, you know, an LTL truck. Um, so th there's a certain richness to the Line 10 platform in terms of customer visibility and what they get, uh, the, the real-time GPS tracking, et cetera. Um, so we do get that data back to VL Omni from Line 10. Uh, we don't typically integrate it into a Shopify Plus scenario because we don't have placeholders for a lot of that data. But once that order has been delivered and dis has been dispatched and actually ultimately delivered, we get the completion information uh, back from Line 10, which we then post back up to Sh Shopify. And that allows us to close the customer service loop and the customer experience loop as well. Um, and, and I think that's the richness of, of the relationship is that we can bridge the e-commerce world with the delivery world. So, David, going uh, on to our next slide, I'm going to just briefly talk about what we do uh, yeah. in terms of VL. And then we can talk about the very last slide where we talk about stra strategy because everything we've talked about here has really been about strategy. And this... This also speaks to the way that VL approaches data integration. Many, many companies approach data integration as I want a plug and play solution. Uh, I want the cheapest solution. It's not part of their strategic thinking uh, in terms of the, the way that they approach the customer experience. Uh, our platforms are serverless, they're elastic, they're scalable. They allow for point to multi-point data movements. So we can take an order off Shopify, put it into the ERP, put it into uh, line 10 uh, or into the CRM. And um, this allows us to provide a much more holistic uh, data, data movement solution. And it speaks to, uh, as we've talked about throughout this whole webinar, it, it talks to the various strategic elements of what a retailer needs to be thinking about. It's not only, it's no longer about your front end only. It's about your back end application stack. It's about the solutions that you're putting in place to tie these systems together. And as David has so eloquently uh, you know, said, it's also about how you think about your delivery experiences. So leading in really to our last slide, it's, it's, it's all about the customer experience that you want to engender. And, I'm gonna leave you with some, some thoughts, um, is that you've gotta think of your, your technology partners as strategic and not tactical. There was a very interesting discussion on LinkedIn the other day um, by um, somebody who is a, a fairly uh, serious influencer in the, uh, in the retail world, talking about how startups and small SMBs that are subject matter experts are really being disrespected by a lot of the big retailers in that, you know, they're not getting paid on time. And one comment was, well, you're lucky to be working with us. Um, and it really speaks to this, this orientation change that needs to happen in that the technology partners like Line 10 and VL need to be looked at as strategic because we're there to help you grow your GMV. We're not just tactical people that you can plug in and turn on and turn off. Um, and it's really important to, to think about how that strategy segues with the needs of your customers, how they want to shop, where they want to shop, how they want to have product delivered, how they want things to arrive, what they want to see. Um, and this is where we work really well with you guys, Dave, to, to figure out um, in the, you know, with the customers, you know, that we worked with, of, of how do we optimize that customer experience so that it's cost effective and it segues with what the brand DNA is. So I'm gonna leave it at that. Dave, if, if you've got some things to add at the end here, um, please jump in. And no, I, think, I think for me, uh, look, I, I completely agree with your points. 
I would only say to retailers listening that from our experience, those that move, uh, I guess, cumbersome or that are that are slow, like there's obviously a bureaucracy in larger corporates that you're going to have to deal with as a PM or or as a lead that's 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 moving a logistics proposition or an integration proposition of any kind through the organization. But you know, the way to navigate that and move that faster is by having a partner. Because as far as you're concerned, the longer you spend trying to learn about an industry that you haven't worked in or maybe you've touched a part of or, uh, you know, the longer it will take for your organization to move. And the easier it is for organizations that are more agile, you know, that you can think of out there to, 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 catch, to catch up and pass you by. So that's, that's the only thing I would say. And, and, and you are right. Like we're, at the end of the day, don't get involved in this tech if it's not going to grow your business. Don't no, get involved absolutely. in this Go grow that GMV because realistically, that's all we want to do. Um, because we grow our GMV too. Yep. Great. Sorry, I just blew through the last couple slides there. Thank you for everybody for attending and bearing with us. Obviously, it's a very interesting thread of conversation and obviously very strategically important to uh, a variety of businesses out there. I do want to open it up to uh, the audience if there are any questions that uh, anybody have for our two panelists here, Robin and David. Um, I'm going to give it one second just to see if anybody's got any burning thoughts. Actually, here's a good one. Um, are there any verticals or industries where uh, this solution would not work? We talked a lot about what did work, but uh, let's talk about maybe the flip side. That's an interesting one, David. Any ideas? Um, solutions where it doesn't work. Uh, well, the the piece around line ten, we're, we're an aggregation platform. You know, if you're looking at it from a colder view. So at the end of the day, the advantage should be that we are onboarding different delivery divisions that are specialists in different industries, who will want to fill their troughs, their their quieter times during their days. Obviously, large eighteen wheeler is not going to want to do hot pizza deliveries. But there's symmetry between these delivery provisions across different different industries. And technically, as long as you can create the audit trail that's required in each vector in each industry, you should be able to use these different delivery provisions for those different industries. Again, there are the extreme examples, right? 18 wheeler doing a white glove service, white glove service trying to deliver pallets of you know cattle feed, not necessarily something you're going to have crossing. But it, is this solution fit for all industries? It should be. Now, whether you as a retailer decide that you just want to keep owning that yourself, keep it in house, that is often a personal endeavor and we appreciate it, but there has to be a good backing behind why that's the case. And that yeah, I, think, I think also, David, where I could see uh, a non-fit is any place where there's regulations that don't allow it. So like, for example, in Ontario, liquor delivery, uh, you wouldn't be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So that that would be that would be something that there may be somebody that wants to do it, but uh, rules and regulations do not allow. Great answer. So, we have another one came in here. Uh, do you do fleet management, um, or is there a tool for that? Yeah. So when you look at fleet management, we have as part of our of our platform, our offering, we have both the aggregation of fleets, so fleets that are owned by you know. Uh, that, that owns that fleet, that delivery company, uh, and the dispatch system they have. But then we also have a dispatch system that we can use to empower fleets. So if there's a fleet out there that, for example, there's five drivers and there's an owner of those five drivers and they're not technically capable, but operationally very strong, we can give them our dispatch app and then they can either A, take work from line 10, or B, use that dispatch technology themselves to deliver for their other customers. So in terms of us managing the fleet directly, that's the first that goes. In terms of actually managing directly with the drivers, that would break the model, right? Because what we always want to do is we want to endeavor to have someone that we can rely on, the owner of that fleet, the accountable. Uh, and so that's where we sit on that one. Fantastic. And we've got time for one more question. Uh, how long does a solution like this take in terms of uh, the line pen and the Alumni? Robin, I don't know, from, from your standpoint, I understand that you have varying degrees of size of integrations, but if we're looking at just the VL Omni to line 10 integration through Shopify, for example. Um, if, 
Yeah, yeah, it's not a it's not an arduous task. Um, I think the biggest there are two components. One is the setting up of the, the delivery mechanisms, or what we call on the Shopify side, the ship methods. Uh, making sure that the ship methods align with what's aligned, what is being set up on the Line Ten platform. Uh, the actual integration itself and testing. I mean, typically a couple of weeks. Um, so yes. it's fairly quick. I mean, I think there's. There's, there's, there's your play as well as how fast they're set up on, you know, the line 10 platform as well. Yeah. I think for, from us, it's, it's very simple. Customer comes to the door. If that delivery partner is on the platform, we can get you live in days. If that's a non-integrated approach, you can use yeah. our dashboards. We have dashboard technology that can give you, you know, utilization performance, uh, gives you uh, service level management performance, uh, on time, early scores, everything. But if you want an integrated solution, it's how fast can you integrate into line 10? And lastly, if there's a region that we're not operating in, it doesn't really change the mandate. We take an average of four to six weeks. I think the fastest delivery provider integration we've done was four days. Um, but we always say four to six weeks just in case to onboard any delivery provision, pending they have technically, um, you know, technically, they're technically strong and they have a dispatch system or they're willing to take our dispatch system and get the ball rolling. And beyond that, you know, it's ensuring that the delivery proposition itself has been cleared off by both us as your strategic partner on that one and you guys. And, and then here we go. Yep. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And one last question off of that, I'm sure it's going to be a short answer. Is the dispatch app proprietary? Well, David, I think this one's for you. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, the dispatch app for us is proprietary. That's something that we own in house and, and we built off learnings both using other dispatch technologies within our other dispatch uh, partners uh, and the learnings of being a delivery management platform. So you can imagine having an insight into all these different dispatch technologies globally uh, gives you a leg up in terms of what's happening in the space. Now, don't get me wrong. Sometimes what we like to do is we like to push uh, retailers to use our other dispatch partners out there. For example, Onfleet, an incredible dispatch system, amazing guys based out in San Francisco. We'll often say to US customers uh, or US delivery companies that are not tech savvy, we'll say, guys, reach out to Onfleet, here's the contact. Uh, and the reason why we do that is because we want to empower the community. We want to empower the, the community of delivery provisions. So by empowering Onfleet, by empowering Brisk, you name it, we're we're ultimately increasing what is our partnership strength across the board rather than trying to do something that they do so well themselves. Fantastic. Well, we still have questions rolling in here, but unfortunately we are out of time. I flip back to our contact us slide. I do encourage people to reach out to either via Lomi line 10, or you're more than welcome to include both emails in an email there to get both Robin and David involved in the discussion. Uh, we have, Sorry, David, would you like to answer one of the questions? I see you just pinged in the app there. I was, I was just looking. No, 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 that's okay. I think the best thing to do is if anybody has a question, david at line10.com, don't hesitate to, to ping me an email and I'm happy to jump on a call. I mean, all of these are really relevant. Like how do you work with warehouse outside of central areas? We have partners, the likes of um, uh, FlowSpace and, and many other warehouse management system and warehouse management partners that we use. So there's a lot of really great questions here. Do you integrate with Just Eat, Restaurant and Deliveroo? We can take that offline. If those guys want to reach out to David at line10.com or even info at line10.com, we'll, uh, we'll set up a call and move forward accordingly. Perfect. Yeah. I did share your email address in the chat there. I think everybody has visibility Amazing. for that. If Amazing. not, definitely the general email box is fine. Amazing. <laughs> so thank you to everybody. I know we ran a little bit over here, but I mean, the uh, amount of questions pouring in definitely say that this is a very hot topic and people are interested in exploring this more. Thank you to both of our presenters, David and Robin. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedules to sit and uh, inform the audience on how to strategically grow your GMB with uh, strategically integrated delivery and fulfillment. Thank you, everybody. Have a great evening or afternoon. Thanks, David.